Let's not waste any time and dive right into part 5 of the top 10 terrifying people in history the FBI want you to forget about. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Keith Hunter Jesperson. Also known as the happy face killer, Keith was so desperate for attention for his crimes, it might have led to his own demise. Keith is a killer who, after the body of his first victim was found, had someone else actually claim to be responsible for his crimes. When you're trying to get away with killing people, having someone else falsely confess to your crime would likely seem like the best case scenario, right? Well, not for Keith. He wanted to be known for his crimes, so to help himself get media attention, he drew a smiley face on a bathroom wall hundreds of miles away from his crime scene, and here he left an anonymous letter where he confessed to the crime and provided proof. He didn't end up receiving a reply, so he decided to write more letters to the media and to authorities, each signed with a smiley face. In the end, Keith was initially caught after he became the prime suspect in the death of his girlfriend at the time. Previously, his victims had been people he had no connection to, so this truly was the mistake the authorities needed to catch him. Keith then admitted to his crimes, and while he has formally been linked to eight deaths, he has confessed to somewhere around 185. Keith was tried and sentenced to life without parole for his heinous crimes, and he remains in prison at Oregon State Penitentiary. In our number 9 spot today, we have Franklin Dwayne Alex. Franklin is a man who had quite an insane crime spree that lasted for about 6 months in the 1990s. Although short, it was anything but sweet. This spree started off in August of 1997 in Houston, Texas. Over the course of this spree, Franklin took the lives of at least 3 people. He committed robberies, he harmed people, he attempted to take more lives where thankfully the people survived, he kidnapped people, literally any serious crime he could commit during those six months he was doing it. In the end, Franklin was caught and put on trial for his crime spree, and he received a sentence of death which was carried out on March 30th, 2010. In our number 8 spot today, we have David Parker Ray. Often referred to as the toy box killer, this guy is anything but fun. This serial killer nickname comes from how he soundproofed a semi-trailer, which he called his toy box, and he equipped it full of everything a nightmare human being would need to commit his horrific crimes. Here's the thing, although he was highly suspected of taking lives, there was never enough evidence to prove it because the bodies were never found. This means that although many people are quite sure that he did such things, he was never officially tried for it. He was, however, tried and convicted for kidnapping as well as for harming those he had taken. He would sometimes include his wife in these instances, if she was a willing participant, and then many of those he took he would later drop off on the side of the road somewhere after using barbiturates in an attempt to destroy their memories that could potentially identify him. Whether he took any lives or not is still up for debate, I suppose, but that does not mean he is any better than anyone else on this list. He is equally as horrible of a person. In the and David was convicted for his crimes, which is thought to be up in the range of about 60 instances in 2001, and then he died of a heart attack in 2002 in prison. In our number 7 spot today, we have Arthur Shawcross. This man is also known as the Genesee River Killer, and his crime spree began in 1972. In trying to navigate these online guidelines, I can't exactly say who he specifically targeted, but what I will say is that while everyone on this list is particularly horrible, Arthur is worse some of the worst of the worst if you catch my drift. This story, however, is a little unlike some of the others today because after the first two of his crimes, he was apprehended, but for some insane reason, they allowed him to have a plea bargain where he was allowed to plead guilty to just one charge of only manslaughter, for which he served 14 years of his 25-year sentence. In the least surprising turn of events, once he was released on early probation, his real crime spree got started. He would go on to take the lives of 12 women from 1988 and 1989. Thankfully, he was finally caught for these crimes and sent right back to prison. Of course, his initial early release was the subject of huge controversy, rightfully, and Dr. Michael H. Stone, professor of psychiatry at Columbia University, called this early release, quote, one of the most egregious examples of the unwarranted release of a prisoner. In the end, Arthur passed away in prison while serving a 250 year sentence. He passed in 2008 after suffering a heart attack. In our number six spot today, we have Richard Ramirez. Richard, who is also known as the Knights 
Stalker was a serial killer who terrorized the streets of Los Angeles in the 1980s. He was known for his MO of invading homes, which left him initially being dubbed as the walk-in killer, but he had another signature that was concerning to many people, especially during the height of the satanic panic. Richard was known for leaving behind different satanic messages at the scene of his crimes. Because of his satanic signature, after he left his first pentagram at the scene of the crime, authorities became worried that he was a Charles Manson copycat, but instead he was just his own kind of monster. It is said that he would leave more pentagrams behind while also telling his victims to swear to Satan instead of God. During his court appearances, he would hold up a pentagram and after pleading not guilty, he said, Hail Satan. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Colonial Parkway Monster. Between 1986 and 1989, there were three couples who were found in their cars after their lives had been taken and all of these couples were found along Virginia's Colonial Parkway. Although this is a horrific thing that investigators believed to be linked, all these years later, whoever is responsible for these crimes remains somewhere at large. There are plenty of theories as to who could have done this, just like with any cold case of this kind, but terrifyingly, many people believe that the culprit may have been someone impersonating a police officer. This is because each of the victims were found with their glove compartments open, which some believe indicates that they were reaching for their registration, and this might be the reason as to why they even pulled over in the first place. This is just a theory, however, and true or not, at this point, it isn't bringing us any closer to finding out who is really responsible for these horrific crimes. In our number four spot today, we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s. They were married, and on the outside, they appear just like a couple of harmless hippies. We all know not to judge a book by its cover, though. In the end, they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Yeah, not just a thing for Salem in the 1600s, unfortunately. Basically, together, the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 and 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her, quote, health, power, and beauty. Sounds like someone was a little jealous to me. They next killed one guy that they worked in a farm with because they said that he was a demon. The final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed that he was a quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life. Neither of them have shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. In our number three spot today, we have Kenneth Bianchi. The Hillside Strangler, which was later found out to be a pair of cousins working together, were Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono Jr. The two were charged and convicted for harming and taking the lives of 10 separate women together, with Kenneth taking the lives of two others on his own. After an extremely intensive investigation and the arrest of the two, Kenneth began to try and set up an insanity defense. He claimed disassociative identity disorder, he blamed his alter ego, Steve, for the horrific multitude of crimes. Luckily, however, a court psychologist, Dr. Martin Orne, observed him and his behavior and found that his claims were untrue. After being presented with this finding, Kenneth agreed to plead guilty and testify against his cousin in exchange for leniency on his sentence. He ended up being sentenced to life in prison, with his cousin getting sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. While Angelo had a heart attack and passed in 2002, Kenneth still remains in prison. In our number two spot today, we have Vicky Don Jackson. Vicky was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989, but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a very dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicky was working for recorded a number of deaths that was unusual. It was a higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old, so of course people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread spread that someone just might be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of called Mivacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving them too much of this missing drug. It was a muscle relaxant. Take in that this is 10 people between December and February. That is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found those people rude or, quote, too demanding. 
In our number one spot today, we have the Axemen of New Orleans. Unfortunately, this is not the name of some terrible horror flick, and instead it is the moniker given to a terrible, unidentified serial killer. This person was active in New Orleans, Louisiana, and its surrounding areas from May of 1918 to October 1919. As the name implies, those who were targeted by this person were usually attacked with an axe, and it was usually one that actually belonged to the victims themselves. Many people believe that this person may have been targeting people of Italian descent because this was the theme among the victims, and some also believe that he was mainly targeting women and only took the lives of men when they tried to intervene. This is actually somewhat supported by the homes where women were killed, but the men weren't. In the end, although this person is responsible for taking at least 12 lives, exactly who the Axeman is or was remains a mystery. Alright guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlovsky, and I will see you again soon. Goodbye.